Welcome everybody. We're super excited to be here with you all today to share this space with you all. My name is Terrell Morton. I'm an assistant professor of identity and justice and STEM education at the University of Missouri Columbia. I'm Ilana Horn. I go by Lonnie and I am a professor of mathematics education at Vanderbilt University. And Lonnie and I are both now leaders in the cadre space, the community for advancing discovery, research and education. Cadre as an educational resource center is centered within the NSF discovery research K-12 STEM space that provides a plethora of different support structures, training opportunities for early career researchers, access to information and scholarship all within the K-12 STEM education arena. And this opportunity that we're sharing now is kind of like a new idea that we're trying to play with. Yeah. You wanna tell them a little bit about it, Lonnie? Yeah, sure. Terrell and I thought we needed a podcast in our life. So um, we proposed doing this thing we call the hidden curriculum, uncovering the hidden curriculum of DRK-12. And our goal is to uh, sort of pull back the curtain a little and explain how things go on based on our own experience as investigators, as reviewers, and so on, to in the hopes of broadening the pool of potential um, funded DRK-12 projects so we can get more voices um, in the conversation about STEM education in the US. And so, I mean, what professor says, you know, we need to add more things to our plate, right? <laughs> like, be like, yeah, let's just Unfortunately, do me, I think, I think I do that. <laughs> well, I think both of us, right? Yeah. yeah. But I, uh, I appreciate, and I know you do too, based off of conversations, the opportunity to really just be able to share this information with yeah. people, um, right. particularly given our own research agendas and the communities that we navigate and attempt to empower and support and how we really want to be able to help diversify and increase um, access and awards from the DRK-12 portfolio, uh, yeah. particularly in, well, NSF is the only space that has the DRK-12. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we think that um, hopefully some of the tips that we're gonna share with you um, won't be so NSF specific, but also just more generally about how to get your research funded. Agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. So we have a series of different episodes that we're going to be sharing, of course, as our introduction episode. It's always a little information that gets put out at the very beginning. Um, and we'll have different guests coming on into our podcast. We'll have tips that we always try to provide after our conversations or even during our conversations, recognizing that we're really hoping that this becomes yet another resource for educators, for scholars, for practitioners, policymakers, people who have the boots on the ground right. and really trying to make change in our K-12 STEM spaces. And actually beyond because, well, does DRK-12 fund higher ed stuff? Um, I haven't seen that is specifically. Is it P16 or is it just DRK-12? Like, now I'm, I'm wondering. See, you are always learning. Always. When you work learning. on this uh, project, you're always learning. I also need to just make a little caveat that um, it is a snow day here. So I thought Terrell and I scheduled this um, recording session for when I thought I was gonna have an empty house with just me and my dog. But it turns out I have a house full of people who have been instructed to be quiet, but may not. So if you hear strange voices in the background, it's probably somebody in my family. But you know what, Lonnie, I think given your superstardom and your emerging superstardom through this podcast, right? The family wants to make sure that they have their shine in the spotlight. Oh, is that what it is? They're just trying to ride my coattails. Okay, yes. that makes sense. My dog's probably gonna try to get in on the action too. Okay, so our first episode that we planned for today, um, we're calling it Post Panel Pop-Off. Do you wanna explain Post how we came up with that? Panel Pop-Off. But no, so one, being very creative in the spaces that we inhabit and always trying to find 
some kind of way to help make our content stick with you all as you all are leaving our audio or visual space. We are attempting to have some kind of alliteration with all of our topics. <laughs> uh, and the post panel pop off, the PPP, uh, <laughs> is really providing some reflections that both Lonnie and I have given our opportunities to serve as reviewers uh, in NSF more broadly. So no, unfortunately, you cannot find out where we reviewed nope. uh, and Top what secret. we reviewed. Top secret G14 classified, okay? <laughs> but the post panel pop-off is just some insights given some reflections and some general thoughts about how to help strengthen your proposal. Right. So Terrell and I have both had the opportunity to serve on review panels multiple times. So some of the reflections may be regarding recent panels we've been on and um, other reflections may be regarding like our longer experience as NSF reviewers. So we sort of uh, pregame this podcast by um, chatting about some of the things that we see, especially those proposals that are kind of close, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that experience of, of not getting funded can be really disappointing. But if you have a framework for going in and, and trying to understand um, what might have missed about your proposal, um, it can be helpful for you to maybe revise it and resubmit it and maybe get funding the next round. So that's our, that's our hope that um, this conversation can help you if you are in that phase, or also if you're preparing a proposal for the first time and you are want, you know, in that phase of revising it and trying to strengthen it, we hope that maybe you can keep some of these things in mind uh, and make a really strong proposal the first time out. Yeah, um, having had the opportunity to submit proposals to NSF and be awarded, um, that first time can be intense because it's yeah. like, oh my gosh. <laughs> a lot of bureaucracy going on, a lot of boxes to check off and a lot of things to format in just the right templates and the templates sometimes change and it's a lot to keep track of. Mm -hmm. And that's not even even getting into like the content that you're right. trying to generate. Exactly. Um, especially trying to fit it to NSF's formatting when you think about their request for intellectual merit and broader impacts. Yeah, right. And those two important evaluation criteria that you should always keep in mind. And it's helpful sometimes to just look at um, previous awards. The NSF um, keeps that really publicly on their website. And mm -hmm. so if you look and you're able to find uh, an award that's maybe on a topic similar to you, um, the thing you want to study, you can look and see um, what do, how did they describe the intellectual merit and the broader impacts? Because if they were awarded, what they said worked. So it might help you kind of frame what your intellectual merit and broader impacts stand to be. Agreed. And Lonnie, I know that we have some different types of proposals that we want to talk through. Yeah. But in recognizing that we're kind of framing it all within the merit criteria of intellectual merit and broader impacts, mm -hmm. going off script just a little bit, I wonder yeah. if you don't mind sharing how you understand what those two criteria represent. So like Ooh, when I you see like intellectual merit, like how, how do you define giving your review experience intellectual merit? Well, I always look at the definition because NSF has a pretty specific definition. So both when I write proposals and I review proposals, I always go back to the definitions, which I don't have the kind of memory where I'm going to be able to spit it back at you right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, um, I know that the kinds of things I look for is adding knowledge to the field. So, you know, knowing what we know in the field and what the open questions are and how is this project going to contribute to a better understanding of open questions. And it doesn't mean it has to be entirely original in the sense that nobody's ever studied this before, but at the very least, you should be able to make a case for how your study will expand a knowledge base, mm -hmm. an existing knowledge base. That's a really, really important part of intellectual merit. Do you have anything to add to that? Definitely. Um, 
because sometimes I struggle thinking like, what does intellectual merit even mean? Mm -hmm. But like you said, really going back to NSF's PAPG, and if you ask me to unpack that acronym, I also am going to mess up, <laughs> um, right? But the PAPG definitely gives ideas, so just want to iterate that. But mm -hmm. when I but when I take some time to process intellectual merit, I really think about how across my entire project, like you said, I'm able to demonstrate the efficacy of the work to help then right. generate new knowledge. Right. So if my colleagues are going to be the ones, colleagues, plural, um, are going to be the ones that are a part of this review process, how am I making sure that I'm being very explicit about the kinds of knowledge that my work can generate and I'm also being intentional to make sure that that's a clear picture across the entirety of the work. Yep. One time um, when I was a more junior scholar, I was when I was at the University of Washington, John Bransford did me a super big favor and read a grant application I was writing. And the advice he gave me always sort of stuck with me. He said, you want your reviewer to be able to picture the kind of findings that your study will yield so that they go, aha, I wanna spend money on this. So yeah. that image has always kind of stuck with me. And especially in the end stages of refining and revising a proposal, mm -hmm. I always ask myself, does this paint a clear picture of the kinds of findings that, that doing all this work is going to contribute um, because I think um, um, some proposals do fall short of making it like pop in a reviewer's yes. mind. And you have to remember that reviewers are reading a stack of anywhere from like eight to 12 um, yes. proposals. And so you really want to grab their attention. You really want to mm -hmm. make sure that they are reading you well and reading you correctly. Um, by guiding them. And so having those clear, concrete images, that's where if you've, if you've done a pilot study, um, bring in that pilot data because pilot mm -hmm. data can really bring home the kinds of um, data that you'll yield and the kinds of findings you have the potential um, of, of getting from your study. Totally agreed. And I would say the same thing for broader impacts. Mm. So as someone who intimately studies aspects related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. When I'm looking at your broader impact section, I'm thinking, you know, how is this work going to help address some kind of societal need? Again, going back to the PAPG and ensuring that I am connecting with that definition, but really wanting to make it clear that this the project that I'm studying is going to help address this particular societal need. And it has the capacity to infiltrate or integrate or you know, serve as a foundation for these kind of knowledge building processes impacting these types of communities. Right, and I think people get hung up on broader impact um, sometimes because they think that always means scale. And if you're doing a large scale study, it's sometimes easier to make arguments for broader impacts, or if you're part of a network improvement community or a center that is a, a hub for a bunch of different school systems, or, you know, then it's real obvious how to make your broader impact argument. I think where people sometimes struggle is with the smaller um, studies, the smaller end studies, the ethnographic case studies, but changing our theory of how things work is also a way to make an impact, right? Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a quick example off the top of my head, but if, if we think that, you know, um, students are underrepresented in STEM fields based on factor X, but your study is going to show how it's a different kind of process that's a huge thing. And that's a really mm -hmm. important contribution, right? Because you're, you're correcting sort of a misconception in the field through a careful study. Mm -hmm. So you 
have to be um, clear if you're doing a smaller end study, how you're going to disseminate that information, right? Because it doesn't do any good if you, you have an amazing eureka moment in your research where you go, oh my gosh, everybody thinks this and they're totally wrong. It's actually this other thing and I have the evidence to prove it. If you're mm -hmm. not communicating that to the field, that's also another important part of your broader impact statement yes. is, is your dissemination plans. Yes. So in thinking through intellectual merit and broader impacts, I think we can get to our first kind of observation uh, of an interesting type of proposal. And when we say interesting, again, this is not one specific proposal that we're mm -hmm. focusing on, but it is a representation of a category of proposals right. that may come through. And so the first one that I have on my list is called the octopus. Yes, the octopus. That's that's the proposal with so many moving parts, right? And if you go back to that John Bransford idea of that you want to paint a picture, if there's too many pieces and too many components, there's a lot of concerns that get raised in the review conversations. One is how are they going to do all these things? Like, is yes. this even feasible? Right. The second thing is, how are all these things going to come together? Mm -hmm. Right. Do you want to add anything to the octopus? Yeah. You know, sometimes I struggle with the octopus myself because I feel like there's so many important components that I mm -hmm. have to include That's right. in order for my study design and my impact to make sense. But I mean, as you have pointed out, Lonnie, if I now am trying to do some broad scale study where I'm bringing in teachers and students and administrators and families and community members, you know, all of those different constituency groups have pockets of research and literature that have been studied intimately that That's I would right. have to then be thinking about how I'm synthesizing and weaving and blending all of those experiences. And if I'm trying to do that, within a three to five year project with, you know, I mean, $2 million sounds like a lot, but by the time the university takes, you know, half or more mm -hmm. in indirect, then you're really cut short in terms of the amount of resources that you actually have. And so it doesn't, you know, the vision that you may have for the project is huge because you're passionate about the work. Right. We're all passionate. I mean, we wouldn't have taken on these uh, particular career fields if we weren't passionate about it right. but the consistency and the cogency of the work doesn't make sense because it's just so much happening yeah actually you're you're reminding me of something um it's sort of a working theory that i have that coming out of my own research which i study uh teacher learning right and a persistent question is like why is there why is it so hard for research to make an impact on practice and one of the arguments that I make is that um, researchers by necessity have to bracket off mm -hmm. a, lot of the, a lot of what's going on in whatever they study, right? Like, so I'm studying uh, middle school math teachers practice, um, but I'm really gonna focus on this population of students. I'm not gonna worry about the special ed students. I'm not gonna worry about the multilingual learners. I just wanna focus on, and that's a thing that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Teachers don't have that privilege. So mm -hmm. knowledge in teaching, knowledge that develops in practice is necessarily multifaceted and ecological and complex because they have to deal with everything simultaneously and they don't get to choose when different issues come at them. So I think that practitioner knowledge is inherently like more holistic than researcher knowledge. And so I think especially for folks who are coming out of practice and becoming mm -hmm. researchers, the bracketing off of a phenomenon um feels artificial it feels like you're you know the reason why we name this the octopus sometimes is because you feel like you're cutting off an arm mm -hmm. right <laughs> if you if you lose if you lose that facet oh no but that's really important so the way i talk about it with my mentees is i talk about it's an issue of foreground and background mm 
Mm. So it's not that you're pretending like that whole thing doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's just not what you're going to emphasize in your proposal because you can't emphasize all the things in your proposal. And there are some strategic ways you can say, yes, yes, multilingual learners are, matter a lot. Um, special ed matters a lot. Because of the limitations of our study design, we are going to focus on this population. So it, you don't have to try to do all the things because that's where you're going to lose the, the problems that come up with the octopus is that they lose a focus. So it makes it harder to both on the intellectual merit criteria and the broader impact criteria because your study design is not going to be as tight and clear to be able to make that intellectual contribution and do that knowledge building. And your broader impact is going to be harder to articulate too because if you're trying to do all the things, mm -hmm. what are you really doing, right? So it's yes. important to have that clarity about what are you after in this study and how mm -hmm. can you foreground that and streamline your proposal in such a way that makes it clear? And sort of building from that, you know, advice that I try to tell myself as well as my students and others that I have conversations with, particularly given the focus of my research and studying Black women in STEM, mm -hmm. Black students in STEM, and how their identities shape their experiences is that the challenges that Black women and Black students may face in these STEM spaces were not created overnight. And so I, as a scholar, am not going to be able to solve all of the solutions in one research project or design. First, my work is building on the work of other phenomenal scholars who for generations before me have been studying this phenomenon, this concept, these people, Right, So I'm already entering into a legacy of work, which means that I don't have to try and do something that somebody else did. But at the right. same time, in adding my own perspective and my own approach to it, I don't have to say, oh, now let me fix everything because it's now going to be perfect in terms of whatever I'm studying or whatever I'm attempting to innovate or intervene with right. um, from my research project because somebody's going to have to pick up the mantle from me at some point. That's in right. Time, right. So, right. That's a really good point. And when you started talking, I thought you were going to say, when you were saying these circumstances aren't of their own creation and they've been around for a long time, I thought you were going to point to the pull of history, right. Mm -hmm. In naming the things that you're studying and how do you, so you're not even, even just dealing with the complexity of the social present but yes. also of the historical past yes. and what you're studying. So like to really name what it is that you care about mm -hmm. you have a lot of different dimensions that you could potentially work on. Yeah. And, you know, from that point, which will also usher us into our next proposal, but another, I don't want people to think that the only way we can see an octopus is by trying to focus on too many people because you can also see the octopus by trying to have too many different research methods or methodologies coinciding. Mm -hmm. And you could also see the octopus in terms of trying to have too many different theoretical frameworks right. or concepts. Right. Um, so for example, again, if I think about the realm that I operate, if I am studying you know, identity and motivation and engagement. And now I'm going to bring in a framework for an identity, a framework for motivation, a framework for teacher learning, a framework for student learning. Now I have all of these different potentially conflicting paradigms and frameworks and theories that are, I'm trying to bring into the study. And that can be too much as an octopus as well. Yeah. So I think an octopus can be too many theories, um, too many methods, too many research questions. It can also be, and it's not to say that there aren't ambitious projects out there that do a lot of different things, but then have you staffed all them? Have you mm. allocated personnel and time to all of mm. them? Have you found a sort of internal coherence to the moving parts? So I think that sometimes an octopus can come about even if the basic concept of the design is good and, and has some coherence to it, but you look at the personnel page and you go, wait a minute, 
There's mm-hmm. not enough time for mm-hmm. one person or two people to do all of these things with one research assistant. It's just not going to happen. So you have to know that the people reviewing your work have conducted research, probably not that different than yours, because um, the the program officers are very strategic about who they put on the panels and who they um, have review closely the different proposals and so on. And so someone's going to be looking really closely at your methodology. And if they've done something like what you're proposing and they know what it takes boots on the ground to, um, to get it done. So if you say that you're going to like develop some instrument in a month, they're going to say, hold on a second. That's not how that instrumentation development works, you know? So you just have to make sure that you've, you've, tethered your timeline to the different moving parts too. Yes. And as we were talking about research design specifically, that gets us to our second proposal, the heartbreaker. Oh, yes, I know. These ones, these are the ones that sort of stay with me Mm because usually at the core, there's some really thoughtfully designed intervention, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know the people who've written the proposal know what they're talking about. They mm-hmm. know what's going to work. They know they, they're connected to the right communities. They, they have some really great ideas. And they even might know like an area of study that hasn't been investigated enough. Um, but they haven't done the, the homework of the intellectual merit part where they might be missing some huge component of like, wait a minute, so-and-so has studied this or Mm -hmm. there's all this prior work or whatever. There's, there's something about how it's been conceptualized as a research design Mm -hmm. where, you know, the intervention itself is Mm going to be amazing. Mm -hmm but it's not going to end up contributing knowledge to the field because they haven't adequately conceptualized the research design in some really crucial way. And those always break my heart. Yes. Cause just like, I think one of the most interesting things about the DRK 12 directorate specifically is that there is a very intimate connection between design and research. Mm-hmm. And like you were saying, Lonnie, there's some projects where it's like from a design space, from a intervention space, from an innovation mm-hmm. space, you just see so much potential given your own experiences with boots on the ground. Right. But that research component is just not quite where it needs to be. Yeah. Um, and I yep. think it's challenging because Again, knowing that we got into education because of our desire to give back, because of our desire to help improve, because of our desire to help make change, right? we know that the design portion is critical, right? but if you're asking for millions of dollars to create these intimate designs, that knowledge has to be shared. Right. So that not only your specific context can change, right. but the context who may not necessarily have access to the same resources and opportunities exactly. and exposures as your you context. To, yeah, change. you have to build theory, you have to build knowledge because the NSF isn't going to pay like $3 million for you to work with 10 teachers in, you know, or one school or whatever the small you can have a small scale intervention that is funded, Mm -hmm. but the research around it needs to be adequately developed so that it's gonna contribute um, knowledge to the field. I mean, think about like Deborah Ball and Magdalene Lampert's teaching experiments. We're talking two teachers, you know? Mm -hmm. That was a very small scale intervention, but the theory that they built around it and the data collection procedures that they built around it generated so much knowledge for the field of um, elementary math education. So I think we have examples um, of how you can build research programs around very small N, um, Mm -hmm. but 
if you don't do that work, even if you have an amazing design planned, it's mm -hmm. not going to get funded. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to make everybody on the panel sad. It's going to make us all sad. Right. Yeah. And, and so if I'm thinking tips, right, um, it's thinking about strengths, recognizing mm -hmm. that one person doesn't have to be able to do it all because ding, 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 teamwork makes the dream work. That's right. And so if you, <laughs> <laughs> look, just all of them, right? right? I was accused of making a lot of dad jokes a couple of years ago. So, you know, if I have oh, all of excellent. those cliches and dad jokes. I'm looking forward thing. to the dad jokes. <laughs> uh, but no, um, you know, so if you're entering into this space as an expert practitioner, and that is your lane, and you have this phenomenal design, then it's about making the right connection mm -hmm. with a researcher, a social scientist scholar, an educational scientist scholar, who can then help complement your design and help you build a strong research component. Or if you're a scholar and you have this phenomenal research project, but you don't understand the day-to-day -day lived experiences, right of the students or the teachers or the families or the administrators that you're attempting to impact through your study, then it's building that necessary connection, that equitable connection, which we'll right. talk about a little later, right? To ensure that there's a robust design and research component to your project. Because I okay. think it's all intimately connected in terms yeah, of yeah. how you beautifully scaffolded our topics, <laughs> <laughs> right? The dog ate my homework. Oh, the the, idea, the good topic, but missing, missing something, missing something. Yeah. So if you're going to write a proposal, especially if it's a topic that's new to you, sometimes scholars like they're working in one lane and they realize they get sort of develop a set of findings and realize, oh my gosh, I really need to jump over to this other thing because that seems to be what's coming into play in all of my findings. I'm going to move there. Totally a cool thing to do. I love seeing scholars grow in new directions. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes what happens is because they have expertise in one domain, they don't necessarily go and figure out all the things that have been done in this new to them domain. Mm -hmm. So they're proposing stuff that has an intellectual history, that has a previous research trajectory, and they haven't necessarily done all of the homework to mm -hmm. review the literature in that field. So, um, you know, if you're venturing a little bit outside of your topic, take the time to, at the very least, read some literature reviews on what's been done. So this might look like, um, old citations, like you haven't updated your citation list since graduate school, which was 20 years ago or something like that. It may look like that you're introducing a new instrument to measure something in your study, in, in your study design, but you haven't looked at the technical specifications of that instrument. So you're wanting to use it in a way that that instrument wasn't designed to be used. Mm -hmm. So you gotta do it's maybe seem boring or tedious or whatever, but your proposal will fall down. Because again, as we said, those program officers, call them POs, those POs are really smart and they know who to put on the panels and they know mm. to, who to have to review your work. So if you say you're gonna do something in this new topic, it's probably gonna be someone who's expert in that topic who's gonna be looking at it. If you say you're gonna be using such and such instrument, there's probably gonna be somebody looking at it who's used that instrument before and knows its technical specifications. So you really can't afford to skip that step. And the same goes again for your different constructs that you're discussing. That's right. So we're really going to hammer on it on our next proposal. But for me, given my expertise, right? If you're talking about engaging students from diverse backgrounds, be it race, be it ethnicity, be it culture, be it language, socioeconomic status, uh, gender identity, sexuality, religious identity, geographic location, uh, physical or neurological ability. You can't just 
throw that term out there or you can't just say, oh, this design is going to significantly change the livelihood of these people without engaging the research connected to how people have discussed support, interactions, learning, teaching, development, and so on and so forth within those different identity groups. It really burns my grits again, and I will get into it a little bit more later, when it's this generalist assumption that what is good for one will be good for all. And we see that a lot, particularly in the intervention space, this assumption that, oh, well, you know, self-determination theory was good because it was studied on this particular population. And so now self-determination theory can work for everything. And that's no like disrespect or anything to my SDT people because I actually like self-determination theory and use it myself. Um, but, but you it was need to just know the example. critiques, right? Know the because critiques. you might have somebody on your panel who has written one of the like highly cited critiques. So imagine as you're polishing up your proposal that you have somebody who's an expert, like a leading expert on your review panel. Would, would it pass muster? Have you adequately cited? Now, th we don't mean for this to be paralyzing, right? Because it can mm. be. But you just want to make sure that you've done enough homework, mm -hmm. that you're up to date with your citations, that you know the technical specifications of instrumentation, that you know if there have been debates in the field, that you know where you stand on them and why and can kind of justify that. And I think the key is to not make a generalist assumption, no. like, oh, let me just throw some things in there, but as being intentional and really trying to put your best foot forward with mm -hmm. the content that you're using and the different perspectives that you're engaging. And, you know, just iterating and maybe even reiterating, because I know that you've said it before, but it's this idea of checking your citations. If mm -hmm. you're engaging a process or if you're engaging a thought and all of your citations are 20, 30 years old, you know, if you're a faculty member and you taught a research methods class, chances are you probably told graduate students you have to have foundational text and then text within the last five to seven years. Anything in between counts, but isn't sufficient enough to really demonstrate progress within that area. Um, so, I mean, if that's what you're teaching your students, then why not do that? Do it yourself. Class? Put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. I love that. I'm going to uh, highlight that too as a something that can <laughs> pop out. Um, okay. Do you want to do the last one? Should we do our last one? Our last yes. One? So our last one, again, building from the octopus, building from the heartbreaker, building from the dog ate my homework is titled Almost Doesn't Count. And I love this title personally because as an R&B fan, Brandy Norwood, you know, has this song that says everybody knows almost doesn't count. And I think about almost doesn't count specifically when the, within the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion research. Um, there is a lot of uptake and interest and investments in engaging DEI across all aspects of your research project, not just your broader impacts. NSF is no longer interested. And I don't wanna speak broadly, but I think I can confidently enough say that they're no longer interested in just seeing DEI within your broader impacts. They really want to see it intimately connected to all parts of your research project. And a lot of big ticketed DEI items that I've seen particularly within like the DRK-12 research space more broadly, is engaging frameworks like culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally responsive teaching, culturally sustaining pedagogy, and the citations are all over the place, right? We'll say culturally relevant, and then we'll have Gloria Latson Billings and Geneva Gay, although Geneva Gay was very intentional to talk about culturally responsive. Or we'll say culture, but we don't define what culture represents and whose cultural norms and values and beliefs and practices we're 
attempting to account for within that space. And then again, you know, kind of going back to the whole idea of both the octopus and the heartbreaker and the didn't do my home, dog ate my homework. If you're going to be talking about culture and you're talking about engaging certain populations of students, does your leadership team have the expertise to engage culture from that particular set of students? Or are you close to appropriating? aspects of that research design because of the interest to gain the funding to do the work. I might be going a little too far. So no, I think you are. I was I was going to start, I think, even further back. But then you you went a little deeper. You started mm -hmm. in a deeper part of the pool. I was going to say, just because you're studying students or your your site has students who are from socioeconomic backgrounds that are underrepresented in higher education or ethnic groups or language groups or racial groups that are underrepresented in STEM. That does not mean you're doing DEI work. Mm -hmm. And I have occasionally seen um, people use the fact that they're in a low income school, a primarily black and Latinx school as a stand-in for that their work involves DEI. If all you're doing is showing me that demographic information and not talking to me about how you think about it, how it's accounted for in your intervention, how it's gonna, like Carol was saying, integrate it in your research, like how it has informed your research questions and your design and how it's gonna contribute knowledge to the field, you are not doing DEI work. And that, that needs to be said maybe maybe you were too shy to say it Terrell but I just have to <laughs> have to put that out there no I agree wholeheartedly right and so that's where it goes back into the doing your homework and thinking about who is engaging in these concepts and who is writing and publishing about this you know I'm not necessarily wanting to go on a tour of like naming scholars but if you're talking about engaging black girls in mathematics Lonnie has a scholar who I would attest, a scholar colleague at Vanderbilt, a couple actually, who mm -hmm. I would be looking for in your citations because I Shout know that they Shout out to Ebony McGee study. and Luis Leva and of course, Dr. Nicole Joseph. <laughs> right, so I would be looking for these names right. to see how you're building from their thought and their research and their critiques. And like Lonnie said, not just looking to say, oh, I'm going to go to some highly urban, dense, you know, low income community, because that can come across as kind of savior like. Um, it can. And that white savioristic complex is something that DEI intentionally critiques. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, we, we went there, Terrell. We went Just there. Started. We first episode it. right we it, said needed, it. it needed to be said yes um From a, well go ahead no well i was just going to say so i mean we talked about the octopus we talked about the heartbreaker we talked about the dog ate my homework and we talked about how almost doesn't count and i don't want you all to think that we're just using this space to just like rant and rave and go in and you know all of this other stuff because again we're framing the conversations from those experiences to really help hopefully provide like some tips and some thoughts as you're looking to construct your proposal. Yeah. So if you were to deconstruct what we talked about in the, in the octopus, you know, tips are to think about your focus. Think mm -hmm. about the area that you're really trying to make a significant impact in and be intentional in focusing on that area, be intentional in really defining that area and engaging the research connected to that area. And make sure that your contribution pops. Make sure that, like John Bransford told me all those years ago, like that people will be able to imagine the kinds of findings that your research will yield. Oh, and here's another one. I'm just gonna throw in the last minute here and be sure to account for what would happen if your research doesn't go as you mm -hmm. hope. Don't make it so that your 
research will only contribute if everything goes as planned. Mm -hmm. If things get messed up, will you still be able to learn from it? Will the field mm -hmm. still be able to learn from it? So sometimes um, uh, part of how people construct octopuses is that they imagine that all the different pieces are gonna line up just so. And that's what makes a reviewer step back and go, wait a minute, um, if that doesn't work, then this isn't gonna fall out. So if you have imagined your study going forward over the three years, over the four years, over the five years, and you've imagined different scenarios for how your data collection might play out, and you know you can learn it from it anyway, you know you can answer your research question in some way that will inform the field, make sure that pops. Make sure that the reviewers know we're gonna learn from this one way or another. Yes. It is worth the investment. It is worth the investment. And from the heartbreaker perspective, you know, is thinking intentionally about building a robust research design. Again, the design doesn't have to be massive if the particular, I mean, research doesn't have to be massive if the design of the project isn't massive, but it has to make sense and it has to generate knowledge from a scholarly endeavor. That's right. It may sound elitist, but evaluation type knowledge doesn't fit the research design component. I'm so of glad the design you said that. and research portion of the project. I'm so glad you said that. And we should have said that earlier. That's I, we're, we're really bringing it out because that that is another thing that people do with intervention studies that are super well thought out. An evaluation study just tells us how that worked there. Mm -hmm. A research study says here is a type of study that we have theorized to include these components, and we have found that these components matter or don't matter in such and such ways. And then I, in a totally different context, can pick that up. You've built theory, you've built knowledge that I can pick up. Your evaluation study just helps me know whether to take you out for champagne or not next time we meet up. Like, oh, that's great that it worked, but it doesn't help me design my own study. Yes. So thinking intimately about the design and if you don't have the specific expertise, being intentional in building the relationships to help theorize. And I think that partnership component is important at the front end yes. rather than the back end. So oh, don't yes. say, oh, I want to do all these things and then I'm going to find some mythical person, no. right? Find the person and then conceive the project together. That's right. From the dog ate my homework, you have to read. <laughs> you have to engage the literature from your core concepts. So say for instance, you have your octopus and you've trimmed it down now to three legs. <laughs> read within those three legs. Yeah. Pull yeah. out recent literature, see who they're citing and think about those foundational scholars. And also make sure, especially if, if it's a topic that's newer to you, and make sure that you have the expertise on your team. Um, and dig in deep to the technical details of any kind of instrumentation that you, you say you're going to adopt or use. And it's not fun. It's like reading the manual for your DVR or your TV or something sometimes. But, you know, if that's what you want to use, you need to know how it works and what its limitations are. Because no, no measurements of social phenomena are perfect. They're all, all limited. All limited. <laughs> and from an almost doesn't count perspective, don't make sweeping generalist universal assumptions about how you're engaging different concepts related to diversity, equity, and inclusion and or justice if your project is within that area. Um, you have to, again, from the homework part, define these concepts engage the scholarship and build because ultimately intellectual merit, right? You're contributing to how we understand the broader base of knowledge. Right. And if you're not doing DEI work, don't pretend to be. Please, please don't. <laughs> I was going to say, put some respect on my name. <laughs> please don't. 
And lastly, you know, as a synthesis sort of across all of them, a good just general practice is to build in time to write your proposal mm -hmm. and then get some critical feedback Absolutely. from people who you would trust to provide you with some ideas, um, right? Because again, as you're constructing all of this and you're putting together all of the administrative documentation, it can be seemingly overwhelmingly and it can overwhelming, excuse me, and it can be a lot. It and so it. having multiple eyes be quality control check really helps. I don't know of anybody who gets a funded proposal that doesn't have a, a reader. You just, you can't construct these things on your own. We all have had mentors along the way. You've all gotten help along the way. I've, I've shared some of the help I've gotten here. Don't let imposter syndrome bite you on the butt and make you think that you're somehow weak or doing something wrong that you need so many readers and revisions. I revise my proposals so many times. I don't even, I, I can't even estimate the number because, mm -hmm. and, and I've, I've had things rejected that I then revise and get funded. So that's just part of the game and you, you need to be in it and know that, that that's really what it takes. And there's no shame in that. That's just how it works. Mm -hmm. And so to kind of close off our first episode, thanking you all so much for your intentional listening and engaging yeah. with all of our current thoughts and possible shenanigans. Mm -hmm. um, we do want to provide space and opportunity for our program officers in the DRK 12 directorate to be able to give you some thoughts. And so yeah. now we cue them. This is Mike Steele, program lead for the Discovery Research Pre-K-12 program. One piece of advice that I'd give to proposers is to think carefully about the mechanisms to assess the success of the project. Specifically, when you're thinking about an external evaluator or an advisory board, having a specific set of questions for that group to tackle that, of course, is separate from the core research questions of the proposal really strengthens the ways in which reviewers make sense of those mechanisms to assess the success of the project and their quality. Hi, I'm Margaret Halmarsen, a program director in the DRK-12 program. And my tip is about using the literature review and the references in your proposal. The first is to support what you're trying to do. The second thing is how you're defining the major constructs or concepts in your proposal. And how are you contributing to the conversation about the topic? So use the references to help the reviewers understand where your project is coming from and where it's going. Um, 15 pages is not a lot of space. So that helps the re readers understand what you're trying to do. This is Rob Oxendorf. I'm a program officer in the Division of Research on Learning at the National Science Foundation. I wanted to offer a couple tips for proposal writers to our programs. We often receive proposals that are overly ambitious. As an extreme example, a proposal may intend to improve learning in STEM in kindergarten through grade 12. Well, that is a very difficult task to accomplish, and an even more difficult task is to explain it in 15 pages or less. Reviewers tend to review these kinds of proposals as not being particularly feasible. So, my advice is to tackle something that is realistic, but also achievable in a given project. A second tip would be related to design and development projects. The most common type of proposal we receive to a program like DRK-12. It should be clear in these proposals what kinds of data the team will collect to demonstrate the approaches you are taking with students or teachers is functioning as you had intended. Let's say you are proposing to develop a new math approach that will promote a particular kind of mathematical discourse in fourth and fifth graders because you believe this is connected to more meaningful kinds of math outcomes and learning. And you design a set of experiences or lessons that are intended to promote the kinds of math discourse you have theorized to be important. So now, Think carefully about the kinds of observations or data you will collect in these classrooms to demonstrate that the experiences are doing what you had intended and leading to the kinds of student discourse you believe to be important. 
carefully describe how that will be done and also take time to think about what the team would do if the data don't support what you thought would happen. How will you change these experiences or lessons based on the data to get you closer to the outcomes you wanted to see? In this case, meaningful mathematical discourse. In other words, make it clear to the reader how the data influences your design and development process. Hi, this is Joan Walker, the RK12 Program Officer, and I'd like to offer one tip that can help you to prepare an effective proposal for any program, and that tip is alignment. By that I mean the alignment between your research questions and your research design. Reviewers read many proposals. Anything you can do to help them see your design at a glance will be very helpful. Effective proposals, for example, often include visuals such as a table that summarize the project's research questions, assessments, and proposed analyses. This visual can also benefit you and your team as you prepare your proposal to make sure you have a shared understanding of your project's aims and how you're going to go about achieving them. Hello, my name is Gavin Fulmer. I am an Associate Professor of Science Education at the University of Iowa, currently on rotation with DRL. I want to talk about the audience of your proposal, the review panel members and NSF program directors. Today I'm focusing on the panel. First, when you think of panels, keep in mind they are usually formed thematically and will almost always have a variety of topics being addressed by the associated proposals. That means that you should not expect all the panelists to be experts in your particular area of the literature. So you should write to an educated, interested reader, being clear about the need and importance of STEM education and how the proposed work will build knowledge for the field. Second, keep in mind that panelists are humans. They could be academics, educational experts, research methodologists, etc. So they are as busy as you are, and we ask them to review multiple proposals. I recommend you make sure that your project description gives a clear sense of the overall purpose and procedures early on so that they can get the project right away, and then you flesh out the details to convince them of the merits and capabilities. My name is Michael Ford, and I'm a program director um, in the Division of Research on Learning and work on the DRK12 program. Um, one piece of advice I would like to focus on is the role of intellectual merit in um, proposals. Um, we have we receive a lot of proposals that actually are not clear on the intellectual merit that they would promote, um, in particular around design-based research. Intellectual merit is basically um, one of the two criteria by which your proposal will be reviewed by peers. And it's, it, intellectual merit means the um, ability of the project to advance knowledge and understanding for a field or between fields. We get a lot of proposals that have good ideas about interventions and um, good things that'll happen with then research questions around evaluating whether or not that happened. Um, in contrast, intellectual merit would be a literature review that would lay out the knowledge and understanding that exists in a field and then explain how what a proposal um, plans to build an intervention or curriculum or teacher professional development, for example, how that construction would provide a context for answering the questions that are on the cutting edge of the literature in that particular area. Um, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to contact me, uh, Michael Ford at NSF. Thank you to all the POs for your wisdom and insight. I'm sure that's going to help our listeners too. Um, so Terrell, we did it. We did. We did it. Questions High five. Books, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for everyone to everyone who watched or listened to this today. And um, be, we, we welcome feedback. Um, you know where to find us. Um, we are on Twitter. I'm Ilana underscore Horn. And I am Dr. T. R. Morton, Dr. T. R. Morton. And the and Cadre, so project, Cadre project is at Cadre, C-A-D-R-E-K-12. Yep. 
So go ahead and give us feedback there. And we would love to hear your suggestions for future podcasts as well. Yes. So stay tuned. We have more to come. And thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody.